This is Ross Coulthard, and you are listening to That UFO Podcast. I'd like to thank Motley Fool for sponsoring this episode. I've said before on ads that looking after yourself financially gets harder and harder with the cost of everything going up. Being a tight Scotsman, I use every method I can possible to save a little here or make the most of what I have there. Motley Fool is one way that you can definitely look to maximise your income from investments. The age of stock picking is here with towering inflation and elevating interest rates. Sticking your money in a passive market just isn't going to get you what it used to, but it doesn't mean you have to abandon the market. There are still ways to invest for the future. You just need to know where to look, which is where The Motley Fool comes in. The Motley Fool Stock Advisor Service highlights two stocks each and every month for members to add to their portfolios, and it literally is paid to listen to them. Historically, their average stock recommendation is up over 400% as of April 10th, 2023. And listeners of That UFO Podcast can now access Motley Fool Stock Advisor for just $89 for their first year, a full $110 off the list price. What are you waiting for? Visit fool.com slash podcast. That's F-O-O-L dot com slash podcast to start your investing journey today. $110 discount off of $199 per year list price. Membership will renew annually at the then current list price. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy and of the many topics I have and haven't covered or devoted time to on the podcast in over three years now, almost three years I should say, uh, one of those is crop circles, one that has split opinion amongst the many different UFO communities. My two guests are experts in the very topic and I am delighted to be joined by, firstly, someone with over 30 years of research on the subject of crop circles, a highly respected writer, speaker with work few using art, spirituality, psychology and philosophy, best known as the writer behind the annually published Crop Circle Yearbooks 99-2020 and Crop Circle's Signs, Wonders and Mysteries. I'm going to put Arcturus 2006 and are updated in 2009-2013, Karen, just because it's there. I've got Karen Alexander. Karen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Andy. I hope that wasn't too long-winded for you or for anyone else, and I hope I got the stuff right. And also, I've got a researcher with himself over 25 years of experience, first starting to look at the crop circle phenomenon in 1997. He caught public attention in 2007 when he was a primary witness with two others to a newly formed crop circle formation, which we can hear about a little later on the podcast. A filmmaker and photographer in his own right, he brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the conversation. Welcome to Gary King. Gary, welcome to the podcast. Podcast. Pleasure to be here, Andy. Thank you for having me. I can breathe now. Good to have you both on. Uh, and it's nice to have two guests. I'm so used to just the one. Uh, and that's going to happen a few times in the next month or so. Listen, before we get started delving into crop circles, I've got a lot of questions myself on that. And so did the listeners from the response I had. I was just mentioning that to both of you. I'd like to get a little bit of background on you both. Karen, we'll start with you. I've known you longer. Um, we've known each other now a couple of years, and this has been a long time in the making. Genuinely, I think about two years ago, I first said, I need to get you on to talk about the crop circle topic conversation. So um, a little bit on your own background, please, and how you got involved in the UFO subject. Um, I first got involved in the UFO subject back in 1990, um, and that was through seeing pictures of them in the newspapers in the UK. And in 1990, the papers were full of crop circles um, and um, I saw I think probably the picture of the big Eastfield formation from that year and for those of you that don't know what crop circle that is it's the one that ended up on the the Led Zeppelin front cover um, and um, and that was so that was the first crop circle I ever saw I was um, I think I was about 20 years old 21 years old something like that um, and it was just one of those you know hit you in the forehead moments I just was absolutely wowed by it um I had no idea what it was but I was one of those incredible wow moments so from then I just wanted to to learn as much as I could about it I was very fortunate in those days there used to be a center for crop circle studies in the UK which was kind of like a broad network of researchers all over and I got involved with them for a number of years and got to meet a lot of other 
um, researchers. My own personal background um, is that I'm a trained psychotherapist. Um, I don't practice anymore. I worked um, for a very well-known UK charity for a number of years as a, as a therapist. Um, I now um, do all kinds of bits and pieces, but mostly um, do a little bit of teaching of geometry and art. Um, and I run a few um, courses doing that. But that's kind of basically my background. Uh, geometry and art sound very relevant <laughs> to the crop circle topic so you're well versed <laughs> to speak on all of those i'm sure and um gary same for yourself please uh right okay i was i was um i got a background in law i was a legal executive and private investigator on my own private investigation agency in london and I also worked in south wales and in other places as a private investigator um, in 1996, end of 1996, I sort of had a bit of a life crisis with a bit of a sort of breakdown, really, night, tired, exhausted, burnt out, that kind of stuff, suffered a bit of burnt out. Uh, so I was taking some time out to do Tai Chi and yoga and meditation and learn about all those kind of groovy things and um, met a guy who said he was over from America and he was going to visit the crop circles. So I asked to go along and... One day in July 1997, I went to Alton Barnes in Wiltshire, this famous hotspot that Karen mentioned earlier. And um, there was a newly formed crop circle that had appeared the night before. Um, and I went inside that crop circle. And I always say that really, I don't, I don't think I ever left then. That was, there was just so many things that sort of took place at that time. And I think that coinciding with my sort of life's change, it set me into a a different direction a completely different direction in my life still investigating still researching still making arguments for and against which my background sort of allows me to do but um yeah that was it really and from then on i spent 10 years just going down i lived in cardiff traveling from cardiff to wiltshire during the summer months to visit crop circles and kind of kept my head down really at first and just sort of made my own conclusions about things and then as you mentioned earlier in 2007 i was there with a couple of other people and we were recording a field um on camera that night and then this huge crop circle was there in the morning that wasn't there the night before and that's when i sort of became sort of a little bit more well known with the crop circles and began speaking and doing tv interviews and so on so, so thanks for that both of you obvious question gary you've brought up that uh, 2007 site and so we'll, we'll dip into that a little bit first then before we get maybe back to basics the skeptics who listen to this and i'm I believe there's a genuine phenomenon with crop circles. That's where my personal belief, and I don't always share them depending on interviews, but I'll be honest, there's a lot of them I think would likely be man-made. I always think you can tell most of the man-made ones just due to the way they look, the geometry of it, you know, a bit fuzzy around the edges, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm certainly no expert on them. But a skeptic would ask, uh, and it's a fair question, I'm sure you've got a good answer for it too. You were there recording the night before in the field. Um, yeah. What were you recording for? Was it known that that was an area for kind of high strangeness or was it some other project uh, i wasn't recording myself so it, it was another man who was a ufo sort of hunter his name is winston keach he regularly i found out after the event regularly trans uh well no it's actually before that i'd met him the day before and he told me that he comes down regularly in the summer months to you know investigate ufos and so on and so forth and he's got some camera equipment and he picks various spots to record and he was interviewed at the time and they and, and he was asked why did you choose that field because he was going around scouting locations that night um and apparently he'd driven into the nap hill car park and his dog he had a rescue dog with him well, acted really strangely at that car park at that time and he said that's what made me think okay i'm going to go here tonight and uh i was i'd met him as i say coincidentally in the day in the cop circle cafe so i sort of knew him from that briefing in interaction but it wasn't until later around sort of one o'clock in the morning when my girlfriend and i walked up the hill we saw him there and so there then we had this chance encounter and he explained that he got all this camera equipment and he was there searching for ufos and he told us a story about 20 years ago um that he'd seen or watch this ball of light go across east field in the exactly the same location <clears throat> he said that and this was like 1996 i think he said it was uh this ball of light sort of walked, went across the field he said it opened up to around 20 feet in diameter uh he heard some wheat rustling he thought he did anyway and then this ball closed off and shot across the vale of pusey and he said he didn't have time to even key up his, 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 you know, sort of camcorder that he had at the time. And so that had spurred him to 
get more and more sophisticated equipment and every year travel down from Yorkshire to try and catch this thing in action again. And then, so so we sat there, so that's a great story. And then I told him that I'd been looking into them for 10 years and that because it was 777, we just thought, you know, because I hadn't done night watches before. It wasn't my thing really to catch the whole thing in action, but I thought it'd be great. It was lovely. It was, my girlfriend thought it was a good idea. We'd had some we'd had some strange coincidences as well that happened in the day that sort of we took as signs, you know, to say, oh yeah, great. And so we, you know, that was it really. And we met up on that fateful night and sat there talking. Um, Wynn had started recording just before it got dark, so that's why we know that there was nothing there before it got dark, which is close to eleven o'clock in the peak of British summertime. And we got there around one o'clock or something, one thirty, I think it was. And then about 20 past three, there was this flash of light and it was pitch back, pitch black. And we were in the midst of this really interesting conversation because Wynn's quite an interesting guy. Um, and then about 15 or 20 minutes later, he said, I'm going to do a scan of the field. And he opened up this viewfinder of the camera and quickly urged us to get out of our sleeping bags and unwrap ourselves from these blankets and have a look at the viewfinder. And that's when we saw this huge we couldn't even make it out completely just saw lots and lots of circles we couldn't see the whole design we had to wait another 20 minutes or so until the light came up before we could really see it so that's how it all happened for you there was no question that no one had gone down there unbeknownst to you it's dark it's a field you know someone could have been down there without you seeing but there was none of that there was no signs that someone was down there or people were there with equipment making these circles and for you there was a genuine phenomena card, yeah? Is that the feeling you got? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for a number of reasons, and I've made this argument, you know, many times over the years, and nobody's been able to sort of come forward and say, oh, yes, but, you know, you're not you're not thinking about this. So <clears throat> in, the, in the, you know, in the ensuing years, I have yet to have anybody that's come up and said, made a counter argument to the, to the events that took place that night, which satisfied me. And those are, yes, we never heard anything, we never saw anything. We have videoed people making crop circles, and when they do it at night, they usually use head torches and they make an awful lot of noise screaming at each other to yeah. go left and right and so on and so forth. We heard none of that, and none of that was picked up on the cameras. Um, but the big thing for me is the time frame. Number one, the time frame. Um, if we round up from 11, 11 p.m. until about 4 a.m. in the morning, we've got five hours. Yeah, that's 300 minutes. There were 150 individual circles ranging in size um the biggest ones being around 100 they weren't actually circles because of the undulating ground that they were on that's another story but the biggest circle measured i think 161 feet by about 140 or something because they're oval to make them look circular from above as they go across the brow of a sort of, of a sort of incline and decline on one side of the land um and so time frame you know 150 circles um in 300 minutes means that they would have had to make one every two minutes without lights without anybody coordinating the efforts without us three witnessing it without anything being picked up on the cameras that were recording two sets of cameras the whole time when i've watched people make crop circles for example the mozilla firefox crop circle that was made by 12 students um i'm not sure when it was now it was back in early 2000 they took 23 hours to make a 200 foot circle when you went inside, the whole crop was trashed. There were clear post holes where they'd been whacking in posts and so on and so forth. There was, in my view, no comparison to the size and scale of the formation that appeared in front of us in the time frame without any evidence being filmed on camera or witnessed by the three of us that were there. So that's that's what I say. I think I'm, it's something to I've just it. Been, I've just been looking at it as you've described it as well, and it's incredibly intricate. It's not one of the more basic ones. I'll certainly give it that um and if that was man-made yeah that's that's not four or five hours of work no four, maybe four or five weeks um looking at it from from here um but i wanted to get back to basics because thank you for sharing that gary i appreciate yeah. it we'll go into more detail in some of those other cases too um i'm going to ask you a really obvious question karen but i want to get all the listener bases covered here for folks who maybe are less familiar if someone came up to you and what do you mean crop circle what's a crop circle how do you define that to people actually that's a really good question because um one thing that i've found over the years is actually people are a little bit confused about what actually constitutes a crop circle so so on its most very basic level um, a crop circle is a circle of crop um, usually it's flattened and swirled um, but we also have all kinds of other um, beautiful things going on in the laid crop of some of the circles which we'll come back to 
Um, but the crop isn't sort of cut or mown or anything like that. It is it is flattened. Very often um, when you go in a, a new circle where there haven't been many visitors, you'll find that um, the crops are not laid right flat to the floor. Um, there's usually maybe two, sometimes more inches, and, and then the crops sort of go over. They'll, they'll swirly, swirl either um, anti-clockwise or clockwise, um, and some of them just look incredible. They have to be seen to be believed. It, it sort of, you look at them and then it looks like sort of water, um, sort of running water in it. Um, some of them just look absolutely fantastic. Now, they occur in all kinds of crops. Um, so in the UK, the crops that we grow most over here would be crops like oilseed rape, which is when you see the yellow flowers in, in the fields, usually around about this time of year. Um, and then barley um, and then wheat. And then sometimes we might get through to maize, which is like corn on the cob, which is these huge grape plants, um, you know, taller than me very often. Um, and um, and so those are the ones in, in the UK. And the other thing that people sometimes forget is that crop circles don't just happen here. They actually happen all over the world. So they happen again in whatever crops are predominantly grown in that kind of of, of country so with the US for instance you get a lot in maize you get a lot in soya because that's um, a big crop over there we've even had them reported in rice paddy fields uh, in Japan um, and I mean in this country we've had them in borage which is like a herbal plant it has these beautiful blue flowers on it um, beans linseed which is often grown over here beans one year I think broad beans um, so yeah, all, all kinds of different plants, but mostly it will be sort of barley and wheat. Those are the main ones in, in the UK. And as I say, the, the crops are not mown or cut. They are sort of gently laid down, um, uh, usually in a, in a swirl, but sometimes in other patterns as well. Sometimes in grass too. More and, yeah, sure. In more recent years, people tend to look at UFO sightings and look for several of the five observables, depending on speed, you know, transmedium, travel, um, no noise, and I'm, I'm bastardising those, so apologies. But is there such a list for crop circles where you go into a new crop circle and think, I'm looking for some of these main identifiers? As a layman to crop circles, one thing I've heard about and read about, and this has been something that's stuck with me for a long time, and one of the things that I would think that would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for a human to do, is on the stalks of the the you know the crop being bent, there are like uh, joints where there are little seeds, and I'm right in saying those are tend to be popped out in many of them, and there would be like tens of thousands due to either radiation or heat. And those pop out as they're being bent over, which even uh, you know twenty students or two hundred students couldn't go round the crops individually, popping out all those kind of points. I'm not too sure of the the technical name of them, but is that the sort of thing we're we're looking at, and what else would be looked for? Yeah. So what you're describing there is actually some of the effects to crops that were noted by a bio, American biophysicist called William Gleb Levingood. He's not with us anymore, unfortunately. Who did a lot of um, scientific an um, analysis of plant samples from crop circles both in the US and in the UK. He was US based. He had a background in working for, <clears throat> excuse me, seed growing companies in the US. So he was familiar with working with crops. So, yep. So what you're describing there is what he would call expulsion cavities. So you're right. If you look at a barley or a wheat stem, you'll see as they, you go up the stem, the stem, several of these sort of fleshy um, parts of the stem they're co called nodal points and they're essentially where they do two things one is they it's where the plant stores its moisture and it's also where growth comes from as well um, and there can be several effects to those um, one of the effects that you described is kind of kind of like this popping where um, where it just looks as though it's been popped from the inside out um, the other one is nodal bending, where very often the nodes will be both elongated and also uh, will be bent, usually in the direction of whichever direction the crop itself is, is laid. Um, and um, he believed that this was caused by some kind of microwave energy, um, although he could never say where that might have come from. 
um, and that was his belief. So, so the expulsion cavities would be a little bit like putting popcorn in your microwave. So they heat from the inside out, so that the moisture heats from the inside out and it causes um, these these nodal points to pop. Um, and the same with the um, with the node elongation as well. And and he's he it was his belief, um, according to his research, um, that um, whatever was causing this was the application of some kind of microwave energy for a very short fraction of a second. And it would just be enough to heat um, the moisture in the plants to get them to lie flat. Um, and, and as far as I know, that was kind of the extent of what he was able to discover by looking um, at the plants. Now, I'm not a scientist, I have to tell you this. So full disclosure here, as you know, I'm not a scientist. So um, I don't know, but he wrote many research papers on this. And if you're interested in that, you can go and have a look at them because they're online. They're at a website called www.blt.com. Um, and um, that's where Levin Good's um, research papers and so on can be found. And it's a, um, some of them are a fascinating read. He also did work into soils um, and, uh, and other, other things as well. I know that he looked at soils where there had been cattle mutilations, for instance. So he kind of widened out his interest into sort of um, cattle mutilations and I think also some UFO landing sites as well. So he, he was an interesting guy. And, you know, and as I say, I'm not I'm kind of told you as, as much as I can sort of say, um, you know, without overstepping the mark, because, as I say, I'm not a scientist, but that's as I understand it. No, 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 I appreciate that, because that's the one that's always stuck with me. Yeah. And it was in some documentary years and years ago that I watched. I always remember that really stood out as well. That would be incredibly hard to do or replicate like Gary says, even with groups of students, you know, you, you, you can't physically replicate that. Um, and Gary, I would ask you the same question, that if you're going into an investigation, uh, a newly formed crop formation, what sort of signs are you looking for? Um, mine aren't scientific, because I'm not a scientific scientist either. It's mostly based on experience of going into lots and lots of crop circles. And, um, and so... It would be the conditions under which I knew it appeared. So if if we were absolutely sure that it wasn't there the night before and it was discovered at first light and I knew that it had appeared in five or six hours before somebody had found it, then that would be the first indicator or oh, there might be something here because I know if anybody's ever been to Wiltshire, there, there are no street lights. These are areas, farming areas, which go completely dark at night. So if anybody does put a torch on, you could literally see that light from a long way away it's very very detectable so 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 that would be the first thing then when i walk in them and i have been fortunate enough to go into crop circles early in the morning because you know i've just been in the area and we may have heard early from karen or steve flying or one of the other micro light pilots in the area that has flown first thing and t told us you know so i get to them and walk inside and when i see this expanse of crop that's laid down i can't figure out what the geometric shape is and it's on undulating ground and therefore I'm starting to go, OK, this is not easy because when people make them, they always make them on flat ground because it's so easy to then represent what you're seeing from above. When it's on undulating ground, you have to make so many compensations to make it look like it's on a flat surface from above. That then you're upping the complexity level. So then if I see that there are no obvious board marks where you see this consistent crushing and scraping of the stems, Mm -hmm. and breaking of all the heads and the rest of it then and particularly as Karen mentioned in oilseed rate the yellow flowers if those little yellow petals which you're absolutely covered in if you've walked down the tram lines to get to them are then perfectly intact and there's this just sea of yellow intact petals that aren't damaged and aren't scraped because the stems are like celery it's quite brittle um, then then I'm starting to say okay there's something there's something needs to be looked at here because because when people walk in them, they cause the damage that you might see several days later. And what you then find is that where people have walked, they tend to walk down the centre of these sort of pathways that, that exist or areas. They usually walk in the same place and, and then they kill it. That, that dies. You go back three or four days later and where they've walked, it's died. And all the, all the areas to the left and right of that are still perfectly intact. So how do you walk on the crop and kill it? And, and then if, you, if it was crushed with boards and rope, why isn't that dying as well? Because that would cause more damage than people walking on it. So, so that to me is a problem. Um, and, then, and then quite often, in, 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 I've seen this not in um, 
oilseed rate formations, but in barley and wheat many times, you'll see this beautiful geometric um, shape. And then you'll look at the crop and they'll be laid, say the crop is, is going away from you, or it might be basket weaved, or there might be areas where there's several layers intersecting and it's beautifully laying over itself in this intersection, not, not just haphazard, it's, it's an elegance of care and attention to detail that's been placed into the way these intersecting paths will, will have met up. Um, and then and then you'll see that the crop maybe, for example, is going away from you. And then you look at the each side where the standing crop is, where it juts up against the sides, and you might see two or three stalks going in the opposite direction at the edges. Now, if you work out the square you know, meterage of, of inside of all of the shapes over a 400, 500 foot formation. And you consider that somebody then, we have to believe, walked around and laid down two or three stems in the opposite direction of the main area when we are told they need to get in and get out within four or five hours. I, I can't accept that. <laughs> simply i can't and, and 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 you know and if you ask them to say well can you just demonstrate that to us then all the people that claim that they make them of, of course they don't so so i remain skeptical of their claims that they can do these things in the time frame that they can do them that's number one yeah number two that they do it without damaging the crop in any way and number three that they pull off these little intricacies which would take more time and, and they don't seem to need that time because they can still do it in the dark in four or five hours. So I have a big problem with those those factors. So is there, has there ever been, and I'll open this up to both of you, a crop circle you've gone to investigate that you've been fooled by? Because it sounds like you've both amply gave me some wonderful examples of these are signs that this is man-made, you know, like the damage, you know, the 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 board markings all that kind of stuff that makes sense has there ever been one you've gone to and thought this looks genuine but then you've come to find has been man-made or are the signs that stuck between genuine and man-made shall i go for that Karen? yeah go on um i mean it's healthy isn't it to be skeptical and to and to have to do your due diligence and so so sometimes, yes, you go to crop circles. And one of the one of the big catch outs you see for the early researchers, one of the people like Colin Andrews and people who got caught out was that the media seemed to play this trick on them in the early days where they, they'd have a crop circle commissioned and then they'd pull these people in like Colin Andrews, get them in there, stick a microphone up their bugle and say, what do you think of this one then? And, and, you know, and if they declared it to be something they thought was interesting and then they pulled these guys out of the cupboard and said, look, we had this made, then the whole baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. Sure. And so we all kind of learned from their bad experiences, good people like Pat Delgado and all the rest of it, that, you know, there's some nasty games going on with what the media are portraying. So, so we wouldn't be so public in saying, oh, yeah, I declare this to be a genuine because you could get your head chopped off. But in your own way, you might go, oh, I like this one. This looks interesting. And then later on, someone puts up some evidence and says, well, you know, these guys saw these guys hanging around and there's this video and you go, oh, well, maybe that's a doubt. And so over the years then, when you've been to, you know, 800, 900,000 crop circles or whatever, you say, okay, let, let, let me, let's be reasonable here. Let's lay out all those 7,000 photos that of, of crop circles that we know have appeared around the world on the, on the metaphorical table in front of us. And let's, let's agree together what ones we think are definitely man-made. And we'll put all those on the left-hand side. Then what ones we're not sure about, we'll stick them in the middle. And what ones out of the 7,000, we think there's definitely no way people could have made those. And there's definitely a problem with us accepting the, anybody's claim that they popped out and did that after the pub. And we put those over the right hand side. Let's talk about those. Let's stop keep talking about, you know, is this one genuine? Is that one genuine? No one wants to have that debate. I also, I mean, personally, I also think it's much more... Um, complicated than just looking at the physicality of the circle. So for for me, one of, and for Gary also, but um, I'm very interested in their placement on the landscape. I'm very interested in their geometry and design. Um, and um, so it, I want to build up a bigger picture other than just what's kind of going on with the crops. And I, I actually think it's, it's really quite difficult um, to make a, a judgment and and it's like gary was saying um you know as researchers we all kind of discuss might get together and, and discuss certain crop circles between us and we might say yeah liked that one a lot 
wasn't really sure about that one really don't know about that one you know um and and that's kind of how we deal with it really um and as gary said you know th there there have been lots of games kind of played with crop circles over the years and um you know people who want to make fools and ridicule you know i mean we talk about it in in the uap subject how ridicule has been used um you know to to persecute and and, and damage um researchers and their reputations it's exactly the same in the, in the crop circle world as well so i would i would want to widen the scope i'd want to widen the picture i'd want to look at how you know not not just to think about you know the, the physicality of it i have to say that i actually did try once to make a crop circle when i was very young and um, um because i wanted to know what was possible um and so it's it, you know it's something that that i did with a group of other researchers it was very hard um, we didn't it didn't make a big crop circle and i completely jammed the geometry up um and it you know it what it taught me was that it's actually very difficult to do so you know even just making something small and simple um so that taught me immediately you know to have some respect for what was going on in, in the field um and and also because i draw them regularly um that is one of the the best ways to to kind of you know really get a handle on on what would be involved in if you were actually to think about going into a field and making one of these so so yeah so i want to look at that i also want to listen to people's experiences because you know in addition to um the physicality of the circles there are people's experiences and gary's is a great experience i've had my own um you know i would consider myself a crop circle experiencer um in the sense that you know i've encountered a lot of high strangeness in and around the crop circles also some of which i brought home to my own home just like the hitchhiker um phenomenon that gets talked about a lot so um so there's so there's that whole side to it you know i mean there are so many parallels in a way to what goes on with the crops in the crop circle world and what goes on in the ufo world you know it's just that perhaps the crop circle world is a little bit less known so the idea that you know we might have crop circle experiences you know people who have experienced some very strange things in and around the circles or feel that they have a connection with whatever the phenomenon is behind the crop circles um you know is is sometimes a new thing for people they don't kind of understand that that goes on but it most certainly does and that's kind of where my real interest lies you know i i love the geometry of them i love drawing them i love teaching people how to draw them um but i am most um involved in in the 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 kind of the human response side to it i mean one of the things that i did very early on when i first got involved with the circles was actually i I went and did um, some, um, um, what did he call it? Oh, ambassador to the Cosmos training with Stephen Greer um, back in 1993, because I was very interested in this idea of um, the phenomenon being um, interactive so that, you know, that there was a way of um, trying to pursue some sort of contact or communication. Um, and and again, in the early 90s, I was involved in in doing my own work with that. You kind of taking a little bit of what I'd learned with the Stephen Greer thing and then applying it to this phenomenon. And, you know, we use meditative techniques. Um, um, we used what we did a whole kind of thing. We did um, a crop watch. We we um, did overnight watches. We went out, we watched the night sky and the fields we, and we had some amazing experiences. Um, so, you know, to me, there has always been a, a deep connection and I've kind of always had my foot in both camps. I've always had my foot very firmly in the crop circle camp, but also in the UAP camp or UFO camp, because I see really deep connections between the two. There's a lot there from both of you I've not even considered. And even as simple, Gary, when you mentioned a field they aren't always level and flat ground. I think you're, you see a picture of a crop circle, they're always obviously from above and you get usually a relatively crop picture, don't you, of of that, that it's not the whole shot of the land. Exactly. Yeah. So all you see is, oh, well, it's a flat piece of ground and it's been done and I've never considered, well, that could be halfway up a hill and then this part could be moving down and 
that kind of intricacy would be, again make it infinitely much more difficult to replicate. Not that I'm saying for any skeptics, it couldn't still be done in a way, and I'm sure it's been attempted, but it just adds to that kind of nuance in different levels. I just want to ask you, Karen, you mentioned about experiences that happen within crop circles and the UFO topic and crop circles are inextricably linked and always will be. Um, some would wonder what makes the crop circles themselves. Is it orbs? Uh, we see videos of that online. Uh, used, is it some kind of craft? Is it something else? And I just wonder if you can tell us about some of those experiences you've had. Okay, so um, one of the big experiences for me was very, very early on, um, and it was to do with the appearance of a crop circle in Leicestershire in 1993, because I didn't always live in the south of, UK, of the UK like I do now, I actually live up in the Midlands. I grew up just outside of Sheffield. Um, and um, we had gotten a group together, a very, very small group of seven of us who were really interested in this idea of interaction. And... Um, we decided that we were going to try several things. We decided we were going to try some um, some consciousness work. So um, that involved several different types of meditation. We had an, um, a meditation one evening where we would um, visualize walking into a field and then what would we see and then drawing it afterwards. Um, we would also, you know, use meditation to kind of reach out just like in, in a way, in the way that the early CSETI um, people did, um, using consciousness as a way of connecting to whatever else was going on around this. Um, and that summer, we had also done a crop watch at a place, um, again, in, in Leicestershire, um, where there had been circles that had appeared there a lot over the years. And in fact, the field was at a place called Husband's Bosworth. And the field actually was known as Old Faithful because there would be a crop circle of one kind or another each year. Um, and we had gone that year to do um, a, a crop watch that summer. Um, and we found that actually the crop had failed in the field. And it was it was kind of really sad. But we decided we would still go there because we had been using that location during our consciousness work. When we went there on the evening, we, we had this incredible UFO sighting um, and um, there were two lights in the sky. It was I can't remember whether it was a full moon or just coming up to a full moon. Um, there were two lights, a, a larger light and then a small one following behind. But kind of this, the, the smaller one would kind of be moving around a little bit. Um, but they seemed to be moving, to, also seemed to be moving in unison. And we were, we sat, we were all watching this. We were sat on the ground. We were, we were watching. It went into the aura of the moon because it was a, a night um, that there was no cloud. So there was this big aura around of light around the moon and it just didn't come out the other side. And we were all pretty wowed by that. Um, it, so it was very high up, whatever, whatever it was. Um, and the, the bigger light of the two was, was quite big. It was it was many times bigger than a star, whereas probably the one that was moving behind, you would say that it, it would perhaps look the size of maybe like Venus does when it comes up in, 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 in the night sky. But what was most amazing about that was that we were not the only ones that had seen it. In fact, there were two other groups, one of which I was involved with, one down in Sussex and also one in Wiltshire. And the group in Wiltshire, um, actually one of those group members was was Steve, my husband, who I had not yet met at this point. So, um, and they also described seeing exactly the same thing from all the three locations, all the way sort of down the country, which was really fascinating. And because we were all kind of engaged in the same kind of work, that was even more fascinating. So, a couple of weeks go by and I get a phone call from one of my colleagues, um, a guy called Mark, and he told me that there had been a report of a huge crop circle um, at a place called Charlie Knoll, which is actually a farm just off of the M1. I think about I think it's Junction 23A, something like that. And I thought he was having me on. I, I thought because he was a bit of a joker, you know, and um we didn't get big crop circles in that part of the country at that time. We kind of had, um, you know, some, I mean, we had some really nice ones, but they tended to be sort of circles, circles with rings, maybe um, lines and boxes, because it was still very early in the, in the nineties. Um, and 
I, I kind of called his bluff and I said, OK, well, come around, pick me up. And we'll go and have a look, you know. So we, <laughs> um, so off we went. We went down the down the motorway and we turned the car around. We came back up and there it was. And there was this huge um, formation in the field. It was like a big, huge crucifix formation. Um, so it had a long line and then a shorter one, just like a crucifix. But then on each of the 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 three points at the top there were I think there was a circle there was a ringed circle one of them had a circle with a ratchet around it um down the body of the the main line and then finally at the end there was a circle with kind of a little key on the end of it um and it must have been 300 350 feet in length it was absolutely huge um, but what we began to, we, we went to see the farmer's wife because we wanted to go and have a look. She was really great. Um, she told us that she normally takes her dogs out. And the field is actually really near the farmhouse, but they'd heard nothing that night or seen nothing. But when she let the dogs out in the morning, they wouldn't go in the field. And she said normally she would have to call them out. You know, they'd run down the tractor lines and she would have to call them back. They wouldn't go anywhere near the field. Um, they they just sat side of the field. They wouldn't, you know, sort of have anything to. And she could see it from there. And as she walked in, the dogs wouldn't come in the field with her. You know, she tried to sort of, you know, get them to come in the field. They were having none of it. Um, <laughs> but what we began to realise, Andy, was when we talked to her that this crop circle had actually been there a few days, and and the circle had happened on the 7th of July, which was the seventh day of the seventh month, there'd been seven members of our group. Um, and when we looked at where this crop circle was on a map, it was bang in the middle of the two sites where we had done our meditation work. So synchronicities here were beginning to sort of pile up and pile up and pile up. And I, um, and I just thought it was utterly fascinating you know that here was something that seemed like it was some kind of response to what we had been doing um and um and i i there were there were many other researchers done i i had a, a friend who was a surveyor and he brought his theodolite into the field and we took measurements because i wanted an accurate survey um and when we got when we got those um numbers home we couldn't convert them they were just absolute rubbish but I just don't understand how that happened but there it was all the all the survey measurements that we taken with theodolite that day were useless um and um we also a friend of mine took a picture of um a UFO from that field as well so that was interesting too um and it, eventually I wrote it up into a an, into a small book but it was just the, the level of um, synchronicity kind of going on with that just kind of showed that there was something going on here that was really worthy of pursuit and, you know, of, you know, of interest. And, you know, whether you want to think of it on the terms of, you know, being connected through the collective unconscious, a Jungian point of view, or um, even if you want to go down the route of psi phenomena, um, you know, those are both routes that you can take that will shed a, a little bit of light on this. But I was, I mean, we were not the only ones to do it. There was also a group in Sussex that um, managed to have very, very similar results to their work. And there have also been dotted stories as well of, of lots of people who have gone, you know, to, to meditate or concentrate or ask for a certain shape to be made. And lo and behold, it, it, it will it hit us happen. Not every time, obviously. But, you know, many, many times enough for it to be, I think, significant and and again, worthy of, um, you know, taking a deeper look at what's going on. And do you mind just sharing, Karen, those hitchhiker-esque experiences? What sort of phenomenon has followed you back? So, uh, yeah, the, so what? I'll describe one that happened to me. So during that period of time when we were doing the, the really intensive work, um, in 1993, I was at home. It was in, in the summer months. I think it must have been late June, something like that. I was in my kitchen at home. Um, me and my husband had got a um, friend staying with us. He was in the bath, in the bathroom, which was on the ground floor next door to where I was in the kitchen. And I was just doing the washing up, you know, as you do. 
And all of a sudden I started to hear this sound and I didn't, at first I thought it was a distant car alarm. It was like a kind of electronic, kind of trilling, kind of multi-toned kind of thing. And and as I, I just kind of, you know, it was there in the background and, and this um, noise started to get louder and louder and louder. And I thought, bloody hell, what's that, you know? And so I thought I would walk out the back door and see if I could see anything. Um, anyway, when I walked through the back door, what I suddenly realised was that the sound wasn't coming from outside, but actually it was in the house. So I walk back into the house and I shout to my friend, can you hear that noise? And he shouted back, yeah, I can. What, what is it? You know, and I say, I don't know what it is. And all the time, the sound is getting louder and louder. And I was it would it had just got to the point where actually I was just starting to feel a little bit frightened. And then the noise just stopped, just like that, just stopped. And it was, you know, the, the silence was deafening, if you like, you know, afterwards. But to me, it was something that was connected with with what we were doing and, and actually hearing um, this kind of electronic sound in crop circles is is not something that's unheard of it has actually been reported but to have it in my home was to me it was kind of part and parcel of, of what was going on to me it was kind of a form of direct contact if you like if you want to use that word no thanks and gary just so you know you're on mute gary if you click the little microphone it will take you off of mute um but i just wanted to ask if you had any of the similar types of experiences where You've had that high strangeness. You, you said you have that feeling when you've gone into a crop circle. I imagine, and I'm sure I've seen this in various documentaries, as an energy associated with them. You just get that feeling you're in a place where something has happened. There's a connection to something. But any any of that that's followed you home or yourself? Yeah, I mean, um, same stuff, really. And you hear a lot of this anecdotally. It's synchronicities, wild synchronicities. You just think, what are the chances of that happening that... You know, various events. When you look back at what brought you, you know, brought certain events about, you just you just stagger at some of those. And, and there's so many stories from people who've been around the crop circle. They've got these sorts of stories to tell. Um, and yeah, like Karen said, you know, see, seeing orbs of light. You know, early on in, in when I first started to interact with the crop circles, my son and I and another friend, we'd just been to the crop circles. We were camping over in Shepton Mallet. At a, a rainbow festival and we went back to there then in the evening just before it got dark actually my son and i saw this we just we just had this instinct to look up into the sky and there was this kind of craft and it seemed to shoot out this orange light in front of it and then ride this light off into wherever it went and then it got dark and we were we were standing outside a tent and this is probably the most powerful sort of experience you know around that kind of a ufo sort of thing i've ever had really was all three of us just sort of looked up in the sky and very low in the sky just above the trees it was a very bright light pulsating that was moving quite slowly across in front of us and we were all just standing there with our jaws dropping as we were realizing well what is this this is not normal but then what got even more weird was that all three of us had this instinct to look over our shoulders and as we did we saw this light in the distance race forward at an enormous rate sort of as if, as if it was coming off over our left shoulders and as our as our view sort of got, got here and peripherally we could start to see this big one that was above the trees it took off and they crossed in the sky away in the distance and i'll never forget my friend mark who was standing there just went i believe now you know that, that's the thing that sticks with my memory when 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 we saw this and and so yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you get you get involved in this thing, but you, I, what I can tell you is this: Michael and I, who I work with, Michael Lippman, Karen knows very well. We always, we always sort of had this feeling that that you were kind of being guided in certain ways. The more you, the more you dig deeper into the phenomenon of the crop circles and try to discover the mysteries of that. As Andy Thomas, another researcher, put it, you, you you find that you're digging deeper into your own soul and you, and the own mystery of your own consciousness because you're constantly questioning yourself about some of the things that go on around you when you when you interact with these things and other people too. And so we used to say that we felt like we were being kind of 
you know, nudged left and right as we went along our journey by this kind of wise teacher, a bit like people Jung described the I Ching, that after a while you interact with the I Ching and then suddenly you feel like you're being kind of <laughs> nudged along by this very wise person, you know. And, and I can say to you, you know, the things that, are, the, the areas that it's caused me to research about life and the cosmos and synchronicity and all the various topics, even the Wiltshire landscape itself and ancient monuments because Avebury and all that's around there, has enriched my life over the last 25 years that really the kind of the argument about, you know, who makes the crop circles to me is sort of insignificant because I don't think I could have ever signed up to any university degree that would have given me the experiences which I've, you know, I've passed on my children, you know, as well as we've gone along. I was teaching them to square the circle. When Alan Brown discovered some of the mysteries we found in squaring the circle in uh, some of these big solutions to geometric puzzles, it's another subject, but we've they've been discovered hidden within crop circles. And I was able to teach my kids this stuff when they were eight, you know, simple solutions to geometric puzzles that had Pythagoras and Plato and all these people scratching their heads to try and find solutions to. We've discovered really, really accurate solutions inside crop circles. I say we, I'm using the world, world we as researchers, but very brilliant people like Alan Brown and John Martineau and other people, and Michael Glickman discovered them, and I just rode on the back of that in some ways. But, yeah, it's just, I, I could go on, but, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big subject, and when you interact with it, you realise after a while there's more to it. Let me ask, and this goes to both of you, that the crop circle phenomenon seems to be inextricably attached again. I've used the word inextricably twice now. I hate that. So, uh, too many. Um, it's, it's almost like a 1990s phenomenon. And when I put out listener questions, a few people very respectfully said, are crop circles still a thing? To which they are. If you do any Googling online and searching, they do happen. We know yours, Gary, was 2007, but yeah. they do come up quite regular. And if you've got an eye on the subject, you tend to see various different news sites still report on them. And you're both nodding, so I assume that's something you both are aware of. And why do you think that is? Why does it seem that crop circles were a 1990s phenomenon? Media. I'd agree with that totally. Yeah, because essentially, I think once the media had made made its mind up that that you know that this wasn't a thing anymore, um, that they they essentially really stopped reporting on it. Um, you know, and I and again, you know, it's as you say, you know, you you've only got to sort of um, look at Gary's YouTube um, page or um, my website, you know, to to see that crop circles still happen every year. And they have continued to happen every year, um, you know, um, since the early 90s. And in fact, you know, there are historical cases that, that go, you know, way back. So, you know, they, this has been with us a long time and it's still with us. There have been a few less in recent years, it has to be said. Um, but, you know, I think probably the height of um, crop circles appearing in the UK in particular would be, be around... 2009 2010 something like that maybe 2012 after which then um we've seen a um a decline in numbers but they're no less the ones that do appear are no less interesting um and no less amazing really than than some of the ones that were appearing then so yeah i just i just think it's because people don't see them in the mainstream media i i think that's it's as simple as that really um you know, and that's sad, and it means you have to work a little bit harder to kind of find out what's going on. But, you know, if if you're on social media or, or you know any of that good stuff, it's it's pretty easy to find. Well, you mentioned the mainstream media. I think maybe one of the last big juggernauts to pick up on the crop circle phenomenon was the movie Signs, which is now you know aging as the years go by. But it's a favourite of mine, and I've said many times, as a slight aside, one of my most favourite pieces of footage of what real might look like is in the movie signs when the they're filming a birthday party in brazil the invasion's happening and the 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 being just moves across the camera at the end of the alley and that always struck me as a oh wow because it looks so raw and gritty and that that's always been with me but crop circles played a big part in the movie signs it's on the front cover it's all about signs and in the movie the beings attacking earth are using them as a way to mobilize and basically navigate the planet. So let me get onto the conversation with both of you. Karen, we'll come to you first. What do you think personally crop circles are for? Do you even have a hypothesis or is there a more common theme or themes that you tend to go with? Um, 
Well, going back to um, Gary and I's mutual friend, Michael Glickman, he always used to say that crop circles were like toys on the nursery floor and they were put there just to see what we would make of them. And and I kind of like that idea. I also like the way that Gary Nolan once said that, that the UAP stuff was a bit of an intelligence test. And, you know, if, if you didn't pay attention, then you failed the test. And I think there's a kind of a little bit of that in this too. Um, I think... I think if I think anything about this, I think it's that whatever is going on, it, it takes people on this journey of discovery. I think just like the UFO phenomenon does, you know, that it that it opens you up to all kinds of new ideas and you are forever changed by it. Um, and, I, you know, so I think that's that's kind of what happens with with the crop circles. You kind of go through this kind of process over your involvement with it and at, at every point there's a get out you know I mean that's to me that's kind of how I think about the whole hoaxing thing I think it's a great get out if if things are getting too much to you and you need to get out well you know off you go you know um but I think that um you know staying with it you you learn so many things like you know I, I always say that crop circles wear their spirituality on their sleeve because I I think that um, you know, which makes me interested in the work of people like Jeffrey Kripal and Diana Pasolka, you know. So um, I, I think there is almost a spiritual side to this, um, you know. And again, I think that's, in, you know, involved in getting people, human beings to realise that, you know, we live in a, a bigger, wider reality than we currently will admit and that that reality is probably populated populated by many many different types of intelligences, um, and you know maybe you know what what is going on with the crop circles is not related to some some of the stuff going on with UFOs. Maybe it is. I, we just don't know enough about it yet. But I certainly think that you know this is is kind of part of that. I mean, you know, very quickly the, the thing that. What really makes me fascinated about the geometry of them is that geometry itself is a universal language. So, you know, a circle is a circle is a circle wherever you are, you know, whether it's Venus, Mars or Earth, you know. So um, and and also one of the things that you very, very quickly learn um, with all of this is that um, these geometries and numbers in particular in particular are not just um, quantities. They also have qualities. And those qualities are not just um, from um, human tradition. They're actually borne out by the way that numbers interact together geometrically. So, um, for, in for instance, if you look at the circle, it's, to, it's about the number one because it's there it is. It's one thing. It's also about unity. Um, it's about all that is. It's one of the reasons why the circle has been used as a symbol for God for many years, for instance. You know, the, the ancients would use the circle as a sign for God or the sun or whatever. But but equally, when you, you know, you look at, say, the square, which is fourfold, that's to do with matter and the way that matter is put together. So when you have a coming together of the circle and the square, like um, Gary was talking about, it's an ancient conundrum, this idea of how do you square a circle? Um, because when you draw a circle, there's no way to accurately um, calculate the perimeter or circumference of a circle. It's why we taught pi at school. We have to, um, we have to approximate the, the perimeter of a circle. But with a square, it's not. We can measure it. It's, it's a knowable thing. So when you bring the circle and the square together, you're bringing together the known and the unknown, or you're bringing together the heavenly and the earthly. It's why many temples, in, you know, and churches these days have domes sat on top of squares. It's that idea of bringing heaven to earth or marrying the spirit with matter. And I think there, there is something implicitly implied by that. You know, the fact that we've got something going on in the fields here, which is um, a marriage of somehow a marriage between spirit or consciousness and matter itself so I think by these are very very deep philosophical questions you know that have kept crop circle researchers up till the wee hours for you know decades um, but you know by by looking at this you know even by looking at the gestures um, again our friend Michael would 
point out something when you looked at a, a circle called a hospitality portal. Well, what does that mean? Because it sounds weird. But, but actually what it means is that very often the geometry of the circles is arranged on the ground so that you can access every point inside a circle without having to flatten any more crop. And that makes it very, very difficult to draw sometimes because you have to pull the geometry out because the lines don't don't mean you pull them out so that it allows access. So, you know, these are we're talking about a whole symbolic, geometric, gestural language here going going on in the fields. And, and again, this is another real passion of mine. I think, again, there's something going on here that if you pay attention, if you learn to be a noticer of things, which is what Michael would say that he was a noticer of things. It's it's like learning a new language. It's like learning this subtle language that, you know, tells us about, you know, which is as applicable here as it is in the wider cosmos. So, again, you know, Gary was talking about a brilliant um, geometer called John Martineau, who wrote this wonderful book called A Little Book of Coincidence. And it's about how the the planets in the in the solar system are arranged geometrically. It's not just a random thing at all. Um, and not only are they arranged so in our solar system, but it, when you begin to look out, you see that the, the whole of the cosmos is arranged according to the, this canon of geometry. And to see that then repeated in the fields, used in, in the fields here, again, it kind of gives you this idea that there's some, we're, we're being taught something really important here about the way that the cosmos works. So you know, again, this is, I mean, it's such a huge topic. Um, you know, I'm going to be quiet now because I've said quite enough, and but I'd be interested to hear what Gary thinks about that. <coughs> Over to you, Gary. Yeah, please. Thanks, Karen. Perfect to follow, Karen. Um, yeah, this is it. This is the, this is the you know, um, because when you move away from the who's doing it, the who done it of the whole scenario, you're then on to, well, what, you know, what do these symbols mean? And I often say it at presentations when I give them, you know, imagine if you wake up in your house one morning and you come down and somebody's put this mysterious symbol on a piece of paper or some strange arrangement of geometry, you know, through your door and you, you step outside and look up the street and, and you find all your neighbours out in the street who've also all had one. And they're all, so we're all looking at each other and scratching your heads and saying, you know, what, what's all this about then? But instead of saying that, you're saying, well, who put this through our letterbox? So you put up cameras and you spend 40 years trying to catch the postman, but you never catch him really. You know, people are saying that they are the postman, but they can't really convince you enough of that. So eventually you have to say, what do these things mean? You know, what's it, what are they, what, what, what is trying to be communicated to us? And as Karen said, you know, this geometry is, is, is a universal language because it's basically number. It comes from this canon of learning that the Greeks called the, the um, seven liberal arts, the quadrivium and the trivium. And so the four parts, the quadrivium is number, which is when you think about it, a completely abstract sort of a priori subject. It was number was here before, you know, we think we invented it, but all we invented were symbols to denote numbers. Um, and so we think of them because we learn in school, you know, if you go to the, the, the greengrocers and you buy some oranges and, you know, how much change will you come back with? And we think of it in terms of quantities, but there's this qualitative aspect to it. Like Karen mentioned, the oneness of absoluteness and unity and the threeness of a triangle. You know, three is a triangle in space and that's geometry. The next thing is geometry is number in space. Um, and so three, threeness has the quality of a tripod. You can, you can, get stability to sit on a, a milking stool with three legs but you can't with two legs so there's there's a mediator can step in and break up two people who are fighting because a, a quality of three will intersect and, and so you start to learn oh numbers not just about counting and stuff and then you look at music and music is number in time um and so and so as karen was saying earlier the brilliant work of john martineau when he he figured out and he and he was inspired by the crop circles to do this he 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 worked out that the, the the we were dealing with whole number ratios and proportions, very simple whole number ratios and proportions, stuff that's not complicated. Um, and so he created a computer program and he fed in the relative sizes of the orbits and size relative sizes of the planets in our solar system, and found out that they're all organised in the same way that you would organise tuning a guitar, a musical scale, whole number ratios, two to one, three to one, two to one's an octave, and so on. And so music is number in 
in in in time and then when you look at astronomy the fourth of this of the um quadrivium the fourth art of the quadrivium it's it's astronomy which is number in time and space and now we're getting some sort of insights into stonehenge and avebury and these sort of ancient monuments that make us scratch our heads that they're calendars and they observe the planets moving around over time in space around us and that's how we began as human beings to scratch our heads and wonder what the hell all this life stuff's about and where are we and you know and is there some sort of meaning to this and and then, you know, and as Karen said, really, not to labour the point, but that's that's had a lot of us up scratching our heads and having some really interesting conversations and speculations about all sorts of things because of these topics which, you know, really come up as a result of studying these mysterious circles. When they're not just circles. We can't keep saying circles as well, can we? They're, 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 you know, I worked in Mexico for a number of years and, and, and they call them agroglyphs. And I quite like, you know, that you're calling them a glyph and that, you know, there's there's something more powerful to them rather than a circle because they, they were circles in the early days, but they've they've not been, you know, just circles for a very long time, really. Although they still appear as circles every now and again, just to remind us of the power of this simple circle. Sure. You've both gave two wonderful answers there as well, so thanks for that. Listen, let's get to some listener questions, and um, many of the listener questions you've answered in the body of what you've talked about, which is great. So thank you if you sent over a question. You may have heard the answer already, but uh, some of the ones have been sent in. So first off from Jim. Jim asks, could you ask your guest, uh, Jim sent this via email too, so thank you, Jim. Um, what is the single most compelling piece of evidence that leads them to believe this phenomena is not natural? So if you had to boil it down to one thing i'll start with karen one thing member of the public comes up and says tell me one thing you've got i don't know a couple of lines <laughs> to help me why is this not a natural phenomena oh it's so hard to do this um oh. so hard to do it um i think i think one of the the things is it's longevity i suppose you know that it's just been going on for so long now and I, as i was saying earlier you know reports of crop circles, I mean, they go way, way back. I mean, I've spoken to many farmers who say that they played in them as kids, you know, or, or even parents of farmers who said they played in them as kids. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, historical um, work to show that this has been actually going on for a long time. I think some of the earliest pictures, um, I, I think maybe the, the turn of the century, maybe, you know, so you know that just when photography was beginning to be to be used so um so yeah it's longevity and i think despite the fact that you know people want to keep writing it off it still keeps happening so you know i think that would be the one thing would would be just how long it's been been going on and just and also not that just going on in this country but going on all, all over the world as well the, the crop circles mm -hmm. have been reported in i think I think well over 60 different countries now. So, you know, it, it would be those two things, perhaps, I think. Before I ask Gary, just on that longevity, would it be fair to say the crop circle phenomena could have been going on for centuries? However, before the advent of being able to get up in the air to look down upon crops and take a picture of it or even fly over it, people would have just presumed it would have been sabotaged or damaged crops because they would have walked in at eye level and seen crops bent over and that that would have been it wouldn't they because there's no there would have been no way of knowing oh there's some incredible geometric pattern woven into this huge expanse of crops i have they would have just seen the crops were, were bent over yeah, is, that, yeah. is that fair yes i think that's fair and i think that there's folklore to suggest that 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 happened um you know fair, fairy rings and you know um encounters with things like willow the wisp you know, who a, a ball of light that would lead people astray in the countryside. So, yeah, I think, you know, once you begin to dig back into folklore, you you realise that there's every possibility that it's been going on on for a very, very long time. There's actually an old woodcut that, that dates back to the 16th century, 1600s, I think, actually. Um, it's called the, the Mowing Devil. And there's a the woodcut of a devil kind of mowing a circle into a crop field. And there's kind of like a little story about it, you know, where the farmer was looking for somebody to come and harvest his field and the the, the various workmen were giving him their price to come and do it. And he, he was saying, no, 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 better the devil come and do it than me pay you that. But but that that woodcut does exist. And um, some people have said perhaps it's related to crop circles. 
I think it's possible, but nobody knows for sure. But certainly there, there, there is that kind of folklore element to it, sure. Gary, we'll come to you as well. Your your single most compelling piece of evidence. I just want to just want to on what Karen was just saying there yeah, before yeah. I go on to that. Just say um, there also there are elevated positions in Wiltshire where you can look down onto fields, like at Barbary Castle, for example. You know, you don't have to be flying completely to be able to see crop circles. You know, they're, they're, because the land sort of undulates, you can be on one side of a valley and, and look across to another and see a crop circle. And there are lots, I, I made some documentaries when I was in Mexico for Gaia TV, and there, there's, there's a wonderful book, The History of Crop Circles, has been written, what's his name? Is it Terry, Terry, Terry Wilson. Wilson or Terry? Yeah, Terry Wilson. Terry Wilson. Wonderful book on Amazon. It's an e-read, a couple of pounds, really worth reading because there's some great evidence and photographs in there of simple circles, many of them that have appeared over the years. Um, and so th there are lots of stories that were published in newspapers where um, – um, people were coming forward in their in their sort of elder years and saying, "Oh, we used to play in those as children when my grandfather had a farm, and they just told us they were fairy rings, and you know we rolled around in them and we did all this." So, so there is a lot of you know stories that go back about them, um, and so yeah. It, it, but once once Colin Andrews and, and Busty Taylor and Pat Delgado started to pay more attention in the late seventies, and then wrote the book, and then people started to fly around, and then it seems like the phenomena responded and. And, and, and brought us more on the on the one thing that's compelling i would say it's difficult to say one thing it's it's what i mentioned earlier really it's time frame and working conditions for me if you know on a, on, a, on a feet on the ground sort of level all the other stuff that's a little bit less tangible this is very tangible to me um and so so if i you know as i said if i if i see a crop circle that's that's that we know has appeared under certain conditions um in in, in, a, in a very short time frame then to me that's the one compelling piece of evidence that says i mean i often say this karen draws them and i say to people okay if you want you know it's not easy to go out into the fields in the dark and try to see if you can make one like karen did with some friends earlier but if you want an idea then get a piece of paper a three piece of paper get your get your compasses and your pencil and paper out right and and draw something draw a crop circle a nice one and when you've done that, without making any mistakes, because you can't use a rubber, you can't make crop stand back up, so you have to do it perfect first time. When you've done that, then I want you to take your take another sheet of paper and I'll put it on an uneven surface and turn all the lights off and do it again without making any mistakes. And that's on paper. Then if you want to go into a field and show us how you do that over a 1,000 feet, I'd love to see it. So that's that's, for me, the most compelling piece of... Yeah, no, I like that. Um, on a similar similar vein, question from Steve Webb. Um, Steve would like to know, since there are numerous circles in and around Wiltshire for years, are the police actively investigating the criminal damage aspect um, or if they have come to any conclusions and therefore not attempting to investigate it? Can I, can I go for that, Karen? Yeah, sure, off you go. <laughs> Isn't it amazing, huh? You've got a crime spree of vandalism that's happening over 40 years and it happens in the same place every year and it would be really easy to catch people because you'd only have to stand five miles away and you'd see torches and you'd just drive over and arrest people and yet in 40 years we have one arrest from someone making a crop circle and he went to the police and confessed i did it governor you got me and, and they found a board and a piece of rope leaning against the wall and said here's the evidence exhibit a your honor um, that's not good enough for me. As a lawyer, you know, uh, from the past, I would want to see far more evidence for that. And if I had a client that said, yes, I murdered someone in Scotland last week and I only had 25 minutes to get there, I'd say, I think we need to section my client because he's making unreasonable claims, Your Honour. So um, isn't it amazing that we've had this 40-year crime spree um, in the same location? Can you imagine a burglar turning up in your street every year for 40 years and robbing every house there, and yet the police couldn't catch him? <laughs> or teams of them? If there's 10 teams that come from other countries, as we've been told over the years, where do they stay? How do they hide? How do they not get seen? How do they not get caught? It goes on and on. It becomes ridiculous. Would you not agree? <laughs> yeah, and do you know that's fair, even thinking about that, that you would... As you say, telling someone to go and do it, you're you're usually having to break into someone's property, aren't you? Yeah. Like that's pri it's private exactly. land and it's destroy destroy what's going to be food products and everything else as well. So yeah, 
I also, I just like to add to that, that I also think in, in this conversation, what is not talked about anywhere near enough are the farmers who, you know, mm. have put up with crop circles appearing on their land sometimes for, you know, well, for 30 years, for instance, you know, who, who would have maybe one or two a year, you know, um, and, you know, and some farmers get really angry about this, you know, it, it really does upset them. They find it, some of them find it very distressing. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, that that's something that, you know, we need to consider. Um, you know, it, it's not not just fun and games, you know, about who makes them and all, you know, that there are people, as you say, it affects their livelihood. Um, and I think that's a serious thing. Um, and I, you know, I mean, some. I mean, don't get me wrong. Some farmers are great, and they're just as fascinated by by it as we are. You know, I've met some great farmers over the years. Um, there, there was one a, a couple of years ago who was just spent more of his time for two weeks talking to people in his crop circle than he did working on his farm because he was just fascinated by what people made of it. So, so it's not all bad news. But for some farmers, this is it. it it's distressing for them. You know, they they don't. A, they don't want it there in the first place. And then they have to deal with the fact that people want to come and look at them, you know. Um, and, you know, you just think, you know, someday one of these farmers is going to give themselves a heart attack, you know, patrolling up and down the field in their Land Rover or whatever. You know, I mean, it's it's a serious thing. I, you know, I, I think, you know, we shouldn't talk glibly about it, really. I, I feel very sorry for some of them. Yeah. Yeah, a question from Well Behaved Dogs on what may be causing some of those early crop circles. He uh, he says, uh, I'm assuming it's a he, um, is it possible that some of the early 70s crop circles, which were very simple, such as a circle and four dots, were made by satellite Maser technology as a simple calibration test? And I had to look up Maser, wasn't a misspelling. Uh, and Maser technology is an acronym for Microwave Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. Wow. Yeah, I always, I always love those sorts of questions because I can just see all the military generals sitting around the table, you know, and, and saying, right, what are we going to do now to frighten the pants off Vladimir Putin? And one of them steps up and says, I know, we'll, we'll invest several billion pounds into creating these satellites that can make pretty patterns in flowers for 40 years and frighten the pants off. I mean, that's, that doesn't, doesn't really go for that sort of spending or justifying doing it just to, just to I don't know, make make some new age researchers so-called new age researchers like ourselves look a bit silly it seems to be a misappropriation of funds i would suggest to, to invest in that sort of technology it's possible that something like that could be made but i don't know why or why they would continue to use it for all this time I also, um, I'm so, guessing. I also think that if you're going to test something like that the salisbury plain just a few miles away you would do it there where you would see it, see it. because you can't fly over Salisbury Plain without permission. Um, I mean, I know because I've tried many times, um, you know, you have to get permission from air traffic control to go over. And if they're testing something up there, not a chance you'll get anywhere near it. So I, I honestly, I think if they were testing something like that, it would be done away from the public eye. There would be no need to do it in public at all. That was going to be what I was going to say as well, that you would test it, you know, out in a out in a military range somewhere, you know, far, far away from the public eye. But then again, in the UFO topic, we often talk about, you know, where those Tic Tacs, US technology testing on their own, you know, are they flying triangles of back engineered over public areas? Because, well, why not if the technology's there? But it's an interesting mm -hmm. debate. But yeah, for me, I, I, I would agree that it would be a very silly way to test that type of technology. But that's not to say that our governments and military personnel make all the best decisions. That's so um, yeah, good question. Um, this is similar to what we talked about regarding the what are crop circles, but again, just to convey, question from Jimmy, he asks, could you ask Karen and Gary if they believe that non-human made crop circles are an attempt at communication, and if so, any ideas what they're trying to convey, just to summarise maybe what you said before? Um, yes, I do, I do think that there is something that operates through, through the crop circle phenomenon that is trying to communicate um definitely and absolutely um and and in many different well you know whether it's you know through through the geometry or the placement on the landscape or you know whether it, it's it's through all the various high strangeness 
phenomena that's seen in and around them. So yes, I, I think UAP encounters as well, that it's a definite um, attempt at some kind of communication, yeah. I know. Gary, I was going to ask, would you say simply, and I'll ask Karen the same question, and I'm going to be abrupt and ask you for a yes or no. If someone came to you and said, again, member of the public, dipping their toe into the crop circle conversation, are aliens making these crop circles? Is your answer yes, or is it no, or can you even answer with a yes or a no? No, I'd, I'd say I honestly don't know. It's a high degree of, you know, possibility that it's connected to the UFO phenomenon, and we can go over the reasons for that. But ultimately, we we don't really know for sure. Um, that's that's that would be my answer. Yes, and I think I would I would concur with that because we really we really don't know what's. I mean, just as much as we really don't know what's behind the UAP phenomenon itself, we certainly mm. don't. We're in we're in exactly the same position with this. No, that's fair. Um, Gary, I'll come to you for the next question then. And it's something we touched on before, but I'll expand on it. From Kendra, um, she would like to know if, based on your research, the rate of crop circles have dropped since they were first documented. Karen mentioned it seemed to peak around 2009, 2010, and has maybe dwindled a little since then. Do you think that's because of they are reported less because of any kind of stigma? Or is it the actual number of them appearing seem to have reduced? Um, the, the number of them does seem to have been reduced definitely um, since around 2012. I would say just after that, they've started to decline. Although, as Karen mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, the quality of the ones that do appear still, you know, maintain quite a high level of complexity and all the other things that we've discussed earlier. Um, but but let's not forget, you know, during the heydays of crop circles, we're not just talking one that appears on a Monday night and then two weeks on the following Tuesday we might get another one. There are occasions, many occasions, if you care to look back through the records, where there are multiple crop circles over several nights consecutively. And so, you know, you might. I, when I used to visit them back between 1907 and 2007, I, I, I really remember coming over from Cardiff really early and, and there and oh, there were five that have, that have just been reported. And I go, well, I, I can't even get round five and walk around them and take a good invest, you know, a good look at them in in a day. I need to be here for several days just to cover them. And then you wake up the next day, and there's another three, and then four the next day, and you're like, hang on a minute, on on seven 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 when that huge crop circle appeared in front of us, mysteriously, there were seven crop circles that night reported. So, so am I? Am I to believe that you know seven mysterious teams of X amount of people went out on the same night as they had done over the years? I'm not. I'm not actually sure what the record for numbering of, of appearing in one night, Karen, is. Do you? No, I'm afraid you know I don't. Numbers? No, but but I can tell you that you know you're going to just look through Karen's archives on her website. Um, uh, you you will find that there are numbers and numbers of them that have appeared on the same night, and then the next night, and the next night, and the next night, and you're like, well, hang on a minute, this is this is a serious workload. <laughs> so. so there's a, a question from Shane asks. There's a famous video of uh, orbs creating a crop circle that was. Um, They've used the word the veracity of the Nat Geo National Geographic debunking of that video. Um, have you seen that yet? And again, what do you think of those types of videos that seem to show very clearly orbs, for example, creating crop circles? Is there anything caught on camera that you would look at and say that is one hundred percent genuine? Well, we we'll get to the the um, the Nat Geo video in just a second, but um, my husband Steve Alexander. Um, filmed a ball of light in a field with a crop circle back in 1990. Um, and um, he was with his, his then wife at the time. Um, and the crop circle um, was in the field below him. He was up on a hill um, and he could see this, what looked like a small ball of light. It was kind of glinting and flashing in the sunlight. It kind of moved around the, the field a little bit. It it dipped down into the crop for a little while. It came back up again, and eventually it flew off into the distance. And as it did so, it flew over the top of a farm worker in a tractor who was turning the field. He was turning the crop, um, the soil. As this thing went over, he saw it. He said it, it was the size. It was the size of a beach ball. It was uh, like a bright 
um, light, it didn't go far over his head at all. As it went over, the engine of his tractor cut out. Um, and he said he kind of had this moment where, where as it went over, everything just stopped and he couldn't, he couldn't quite remember why he'd stopped or what, what was happening. But then this thing kind of went right up into the air where you couldn't see it on the camera anymore. And then his engine started up again and um, he was able to carry on doing what he was doing. Um, and I can tell you that video is absolutely 100 percent genuine. It's never been messed about with. He's had it um, analyzed several times. Um, it's, you know, again, you know, people have been able to show that it's 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 um, not been interfered with in any way. As to what it is, I don't know. And um, people have said, oh, maybe it's a bird or um, or whatever. But um, it certainly wasn't a bird that the tractor driver saw when it went over his head. And certainly a bird wouldn't cut your tractor engine out. So that is it. The, the ball of light didn't make the crop circle. The crop circle was already there, but it was in close proximity to it. Um, is that footage on your website? It is on Karen, the website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's an old yeah. old piece of footage now, and um, and again, you know, there were many synchronicities that led to Steve being that there that day at that time. The camera he was operating wasn't even his own, so you know that there was all that as well to it. Um, but the 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 piece that was shown on the Nat Geo that was um, filmed, I think, in. Was it 1996, wasn't it, I think, at a place called, yeah, 96, at a place called Oliver's Castle in Wiltshire. And again, it was known for um, crop circles. The crop circle itself was definitely there. I know because I went in it. Um, So the the crop circle part of it is definitely there. The video is slightly controversial um, for, for many reasons. And there are researchers that would say that they definitely felt it was something real. There are others that are not so sure. Um, for me personally, I'm kind of, I'm not sure about it. Um, and um, I guess I'm not sure because the person who took it has never really sort of come forward publicly to say, I think he did for a while. He came forward for a while and said, yes, I, I took this, da, 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 da. But there's just something that holds me. I'm just not quite satisfied about it. But I understand that a lot of other people are, and and I absolutely respect that. So um, so I'm kind of a little bit unsure about that. But, but what I do like about it is that it does kind of show what a lot of people, th- which is what a lot of people think how a crop circle might be made by balls of light so it's interesting from that point of view but i i mean gary might have a a different view on it to me um no i I pretty much echo the same as karen i mean it's such a shame that we were never able i was never able to meet up with john whaley i know people that did and they saw him after the event and as many people described to me the kind of pressure he came under as a young 19 year old who got this incredible footage and he didn't know how to handle it and i can understand all of those things they all seem perfectly reasonable to me um there are a number of factors which which give me cause to pause just like like karen mentioned and also a number of factors which make me think well you know how did they do this because we're talking 1996 technology and like with Karen's, you know, uh, husband's experience in, in 1990, it's, it's old camera footage, which is yeah. nowadays, if we produce something now, I could not probably knock something up that would be very good in, in Apple motion. You know, it's, it's, it's laptop stuff now, but back in 1996, not so easy. And, you know, I know that the footage was a lot longer than the, the, the original footage uh, than what we see on YouTube. The original footage was went on for quite some time. Um, and there's a whole story behind how that went missing and so on and so forth. But um, the fact that the footage was going, that the, the, the camera was handheld and it was going up and down. And I watched a labor- couple of laboratory analysis of it where it was sent off and they, and they sort of mapped it frame by frame at 25 frames a second. And these balls maintained their height. They showed no signs of, 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 um, of shadowing or casting or anything that would, indicate that they were they were frauds and because the camera was going up and down and you could see the horizon moving that would be very difficult to do in the time frame that this man produced this evidence the following morning because we know the crop circle wasn't there the night before so we've got a sort of time frame where we can say that okay that had to have happened in that window and i struggle 
and also there was a there was a filmmaker a norwegian filmmaker called terry toffness who when he made a film back in the 90s uh, no 2000 early 2000s uh, he consulted some disney animators and I think this was 2004, and he said, "Okay, what would it take? You know, with all your with all your gear, you know, your professional gear that you make Mickey Mouse out of, and all the rest of it. What, what would it take for you to to do this for me?" And and they said, "Well, maybe a couple of weeks, but there's issues with this and issues with that." As I say, now it would be easy, but but back then, that's what makes me go like that, you know. But as I said earlier, I, I don't pin the whole thing on one formation, you know. Um, there's a lot of them, and and we've got a lot to talk about, really, when we, when we consider the ones that that, um, that 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 really do defy any kind of rational logic. And a final question from uh, Gnosis, long time listener and contributor. Uh, my late grandfather was a farmer in Cambridgeshire during the 1950s and 60s. When crop circles became mainstream in the 80s, he claimed to have seen a few of them over the years. However, they were always just a singular circle rather than patterns and never very large. They were always put down to swirling winds. Do any historical records or photos exist from the mid 20th century on this phenomenon? So, yes, yeah, so that was the book we're talking about, which um, I think is called a, is it um, something like a short history of crop circles or something by, mm. by Terry Wilson. Um, and, mm. and as I said, the physical copies are a bit hard to get, but you can get it on an on electronic copy from Amazon. And it's well worth a read. There's some good photos in there and, and some nice historical stories. So, yes, the answer is yes, basically. And I remember John Martin and some of the early researchers also telling me that they took flights in those early days. And I, I remember really vividly John Martin telling me that he flew one day and there was, he said it was like a paintbrush had been flicked across the landscape. And there were just these random circles of sizes across fields, many fields, too many of them for people to just go out and do. And and, and there was no kind of pattern to them that he could discern, but it was just like someone, something or something other was doing it for the fun of it. It was just to, just to, there's a, there's a kind of humor to it in some ways that we've all experienced, but yes. And so he said, there, there just seemed no reason for, you know, that many simple circles is something that he witnessed. So I, I think that's how they got our attention really. I mean, my teacher, the guy who sort of took me to the crop circle said, you know, it's like we were being reminded again to go back in the past. Remember one? Remember how you looked at the number one? You know, it's not just about quantities. It's about qualities. And we want, we want to take you back to the beginning. And so the early circles were ones. And then once we paid attention, they turned into two circles and then three. And then we had this evolution that took us on a journey of how numbers start to play together in geometric forms. But, but it all started with the basics. Let me finish with a question from myself then for both of you. Where do you see crop circles fitting into the overall UFO phenomenon mystery? You know, for someone who's an avid follower of the UFO topic, and there's people who listen to this who tell me they've been into the subject for 50 or 60 years and listen to the podcast, and others who literally in the last couple of months heard a pilot on Joe Rogan and went looking for UFO stuff and came across the podcast, which is great. And where does the crop circle mystery for you fit into the UFO topic? I think because because it's very possible that we are dealing with um, a a unknown intelligence operating through through the phenomenon and 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 again going back to that idea that that to me all this is about you know the the evolution of human consciousness if you like that we're beginning to realise that that. The UFO, the crop circles, the paranormal in general, if you like, are all signs and symbols showing us that we belong to this greater reality. And, you know, like with the UAP subject now, we're just beginning to, you know, like the upgrades in the radar have, have shown all these um, new things in the sky that we didn't perhaps know were there. I think that's kind of what's happening on the human level. It's like, a, you know, that these experiences kind of pierce our reality. And then a, then a curtain is drawn back. Um, and maybe in 10, t- 10 years' time, maybe this will just be one of these, what I, I like to call it, you know, initiatic or transformational phenomena that allow human beings to finally realise that we are part of this greater reality and that there are intelligences out there that want to communicate with us. 
And so that's kind of where, how I see it fitting in and perhaps where I see it going. Yeah. Gaddy? Much the same, really. I mean, I think, I think that um, there's so many possibilities, but consciousness can be looked at as a technology in some ways. And maybe, maybe what we're looking at with the UAPs is, you know, um, not so much of a, of an engineering technology, but it may be something that's engineered and also combined with a hidden unknown part of consciousness that we, we currently don't know about. And we may be being shown how we can, you know, begin to develop ourselves and our own consciousness so that we can, um, expand that for want of a better non cliched word, but expand our consciousness in a way that we can become a part of this bigger community of, of intelligences. Um, I, I always remember Alan Brown saying, you know, when you, when, when he discovered the, um, the, the hidden squared circles in crop circles, he said, when you, when you have something that's quite complicated and many people have gone diving into complexity to try and find solutions to that puzzle over the years, when you find that that solution has been given to us with five simple circles, what the quintuplets that we call them, um, in so many variations that these solutions just pop out and pop out. He said that when you when you get something that's what you think to be, what we think to be, very complicated, but it, but the solution is actually really, really simple that children could understand it, then you're really dealing with a higher intelligence because any intelligence that can take something which is complicated and make it really, really simple is, is in my definition, well, I learned from Alan, you know, a, a high intelligence. And so I think, I think that, we, you know, we're looking at a, a techn an intelligence that's, that's already evolved and we're on the cusp of that evolution quite possibly. And there are lots of reasons to think about that with the, with the state of what we're doing to each other in the world right now and so on. Mm. Um, that, that I remember Karen said years ago, it was something that really, really stayed with me when she said it's all, the crop circle is almost like cards on the table, like a therapy lesson that we're being shown maybe where our ancestors were who built the pyramids and the stone circles and stuff and their understanding of consciousness in a different way and a different technology that we can't understand now that's maybe responsible for building some of these monuments that we can't understand from an engineering perspective. Um, that we're being reminded, you know, you've been given, you've been given some rope as a, as a species and you've gone down the road with it this this is where you are now this is where you came from and you could now when you've got those cards on the table as karen brilliantly said years ago make informed decisions about where you want to go in the future and if a part of that is developing our consciousness i believe that the crop circles may be a blueprint and that in years to come um you know People might be studying them in universities and pulling even more things out of them that we've, because we've we've had limited resources and we've we've suffered painfully over the years to just try and get a little bit of an understanding. And 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 you're very aware when you've done that that there's a whole wealth of stuff still to be unpicked from these formations that we just haven't come across yet. And so, so I think that when when we do finally accept, as we are beginning to slowly now, that there are things flying around in the sky and that there are you know things we can't explain that the crop circles and the uaps and maybe lots of other mysteries as well that have like jeffrey cripple was who, who published about in his wonderful books you know where we'll begin to unpick these mysteries of of um of what it is to be human and and the crop circles will probably be some kind of syllabus for us to maybe understand some of that stuff even more that's what i think well, how can people find you both uh, online, social media? How can they get in touch and find your work? Okay, so um, the best way to get in touch with us is our website, which is www.temporarytemples.co.uk. Um, I don't do a lot of social media. Um, we have an Instagram page um, where you can you can look up temporary temples. You'll find us where we put up pictures of, of the crop circles. Um, I do a little bit on Twitter. That's where I know you from, Andy. Um, um, but not too much else. I actually find it a real distraction sometimes. But the website is the best. It's The website's completely free. There is an image library there that starts in 1994, goes right through to the present day. You can look at hundreds and hundreds of crop circles and have a, have a great time doing that. Um, and um, and read some of the stuff that I've been writing um, about some of the circles that's been happening. So that's that's me. And Gary, 
I don't have a website. I just do it through social media, through Facebook. There's a private group called Against the Grain on Facebook. Anybody can come and join. Um, I keep it sort of a closed group and accept people because that's I, I'm not a great big one for going on social media too much as well. And, and, and rather, I don't want to spend my time just answering the same questions but I've been attacked and stuff as we've all been over the years so I kind of keep it so that we can but I'm, I'm, I really love people to come onto the group and make this and, and, and open up healthy discussions of all views I'm not I'm not biased and saying you've got to be a believer you know but it's got to be respectful and so on and so forth um, and I've got a YouTube channel same name against the grain um, and that's videos and bits and pieces we've published over the years and there was a crop circle reporter website that I used to run with Michael Glickman. That's got a bunch of videos on from back in the day, um, 2008 sort of areas as well. So yeah, you can find me, find me through those sources and you can message me through Facebook as well. If you need, need me to answer any questions, I'll try to answer them. Brilliant. I'll make sure all those links are in the description as well. So Gary and Karen, thank you very much for joining me. It's been a pleasure to finally get the crop circle topic under the microscope on the podcast and I'm sure I will do again in future. So thank you both. Oh, thank you so much for inviting us, Andy. It's a real honour. Absolute pleasure. Thanks very much. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic-tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Folk. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little bit. Meditative game of state full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. out the window after the elf and I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head and everything was weird and everything was red I helped out my boys, they thought this was noise, they thought it was a dream, they thought it was my toys, they thought it was my problems and they think I should seek therapy and I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me. Consider your lies, consider your life, consider your eyes. Yes, I-